Okay, so we've gone live. So hello everyone, welcome to the April session of Quaff of You Boston. Uh, we are fortunate to have Dee Sharawat, a good friend and uh, has been a collaborator with multiple sessions for a long, long time. Uh, he's a fellow Northeastern alum and is a CFA charter holder and currently leads uh, FinTech investment banking as a senior member at Rosenblatt Securities. Uh, Rosenblatt is the largest floor broker on the New York Stock Exchange and has operated for 40 plus years. And I will let Dee talk a little bit about what Rosenblatt does and how they are involved with all the FinTech related activities. And uh, Dee is gonna be talking about decentralized finance, deconstructing the opportunities, challenges and risks. So before we get going, a uh, couple of quick announcements. Next month, we are planning to go back uh, to the Tennis and Racket Club in Boston. So we will be trying to meet in person and um, hopefully we will have a celebratory event so that we can see each other in three dimensions. We've been restricted to two dimensions in the last two years and hopefully we can get together and enjoy a beer and have a good conversation from next month on. And uh, upcoming events, uh, there are a bunch of things happening. Um, one, the CFA Institute is hosting an online alpha summit. Uh, it's in May, I think it's the 17th to the 19th. If you get a chance, I think there are two options. You can go for a premium option and also uh, a regular free option. It's streamed online. So if you're interested in uh, some of the alpha related topics and they also have uh, many uh, good speakers from Wellington and uh, Angela Duckworth and many others. I'll be moderating a session um, uh, during those three days. So that's one event. Another one, uh, the CFA Institute's professional learning has started a new course in Python and machine learning. And uh, Quant University was chosen to deliver that course. So that's the first uh, uh, online uh, course which the CFA Institute is offering. It's going to be offered in three time zones, one in the United States, another one in Asia Pacific, another one in Europe. So if you are interested in uh, upskilling yourselves in Python and data science, uh, just go to the CFA Institute's website and you should be able to find the course and um, uh, the professional learning options. Uh, Hugh, Larry, Dan, do you have any other announcements you'd like to make before we hand over the stage to Dee? Uh, one quick one, the Northfield uh, Newport Seminar will meet for the 26th year on uh, June the 8th which is a Wednesday. Uh, we usually try to do it on a Friday, but Newport was just too booked up in terms of hotels. Uh, so it'll be June the 8th. That is a free event, all day seminar. Um, you get three meals, sports tickets. It's, it's a pretty good gig for no money. Um, if anybody's interested, they can email me for last year's agenda. I don't have the upcoming speaker list yet, I will probably have it around the end of the month. Larry, Hugh, anything? No, nothing from me. Cool. Okay, Dee, the stage, the stage is all yours. Great, thank you, Shrey. Um, great to see so many friends. Um, so we've got a small enough group that rather than making formal, you know, I've got a set of slides here, but we don't have to go through the whole deck, but let me spend about 30 minutes or so walking you through uh, a little bit of perspective on what's happening in decentralized finance, but let's just have an open conversation around it. I've got time till about eight o'clock in the next 45 minutes. So before that, Sri, just thank you for the introduction to the company. Um, just wanted to say, you know, in, in, in about half, half a minute, how we found ourselves in the decentralized finance space. So the parent company, Rosenblatt Securities, we, our core business is traditional broker dealer on the New York Stock Exchange. But our CEO, uh, Joe Goransky, about 10 years ago, started up a fintech investment banking practice, which is run by my boss, Vikas Shah. And for the last 10 years, we've been uh, essentially helping private companies that operate in the financial services space, what we call FinTech now, um, helping them raise capital, go public, um, or advice on M&A. Last 12 to 18 months, we've been doing a lot of work around the crypto, blockchain, decentralized finance space. 
because there's a lot of money you know, coming into this market, lots of activity in terms of fundraising, M&A work. Uh, there are only a few companies that have gone public in this space over the last 12 months, obviously Coinbase being the largest, better known one. Uh, another example of another company in this space uh, in the blockchain tokenized space is a company called Bakt, uh, B-A-K-K-T, went public through a SPAC last year run by a man called Gavin Michael. Um, and so decentralized finance is a space where companies are still at an early stage of maturity versus other parts of fintech that are pretty advanced, whether it's payments, lending, insure tech, capital markets tech, robot advice, Companies are much larger because they began this space about 10 years ago. So I am no, I don't claim to be an expert in decentralized finance. We are investment bankers, have a point of view on what's happening in this space. And our objective obviously is to be a player helping firms grow and help address corporate finance uh, you know, requirements. Um, and that's 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 what we're playing in this space. So let me just um, you know walk us through in you know, how we are looking at the space. And I think it's a very appropriate um, metaphor that when you start talking about DeFi after a while, it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, people's eyes glaze over after two minutes saying, oh God, it's just an Alice in Wonderland moment down the rabbit hole. What are we talking about here? You know, there's no intermediaries, finance reform, running on the blockchain, organized stuff. It all gets a little confusing to people. Um, but if we kind of, go down the proverbial rabbit hole. Let me just lay out the way we are thinking about this space. And I'll talk about three, a, a framework to think about what's happening in, in, in broadly this area. And the framework has three different um, types of financial entities. You've got traditional finance that we can all relate to on the top left-hand side. On the top right-hand side is something that we are calling centralized finance. And C5 basically is think about all kinds of crypto instruments, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, all the tokens, stable coins and all of that. So any blockchain based digital asset, but still traded the old fashioned way with intermediaries. So Coinbase being an example, Coinbase large exchange platform trades the largest amount of crypto in the world. It's trading crypto, but in a very exchange-driven, centralized, intermediary-driven model. That is in the top right-hand side. We think of that as C5. Only difference is that the asset is a tokenized asset. Today, it's cryptocurrency. It could be stable coin. It could be other kinds of digital assets going forward. Decentralized finance, you can see the bottom, is whole class of market structure built on the blockchain with no, uh, the purest form of decentralized finance being no intermediary or basically um, the role the traditional intermediaries have played in any financial activity is replaced essentially by smart contracts. So whether it's payments, whether it's, when you think about, you know, it, it always helps us to think about the four basic financial activities that haven't changed for the longest time. You know, you want to pay somebody, you want to lend or borrow, two sides of the same coin. Third major function is you want to invest. And fourth function is you want to insure. Those four basic functions haven't changed. All this DeFi mumbo jumbo is still trying to do the same, deliver the same four financial activities or functions, right? Financial value. Payments, lending and borrowing, investing and insurance. The difference is decentralized finance is basically replacing in the pure extreme form, the traditional intermediary that has consummated that transaction. So the role that Western Union or some central bank or, 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 or a bank played in money remittance is replaced by a company called Zero Hash that's using you know, uh, crypto tokens and blockchain infrastructure to do money repentance around the world without any involvement of intermediary. So whatever functional activity, financial activity there is, the pure form of DeFi means no intermediary replaced by smart contracts. The reality of course is that purest form is still about 10 years away from mainstream adoption. But we are moving in the direction where there's a lot of activity of traditional financial companies that are beginning to play a role in the DeFi space as well, which gets people confused because 
wait a second, isn't decentralized finance supposed to be this thing on the side where software manages all of that financial stuff that intermediaries have done? But the reality is to have DeFi become mainstream, to have regulatory blessing for, for the average investor, like all of us on the call here that came from the traditional world, for us to be fully comfortable with decentralized finance, some of the purest view, no intermediaries, no AML KYC, completely anonymous on the blockchain stuff will have to be relaxed for DeFi to become a mainstream product offering, attracting not 200, 300 million you know, people around the world, but three to 4 billion people around the world. So this is simply just to get some nomenclature right. What's traditional finance? What is centralized finance? What's decentralized finance? A any questions, any thoughts, any observations, just in terms of nomenclature? That, that, little, that little thing in the middle there is, you know, that's, it, it's always like there's something in the middle between the borrower or the lender and the receiver or the borrower. The, uh, um, so there's always some, somebody's got to build that little um, Tetris or a uh, you know, little thing there, right? And somebody has to own it. Somebody has to manage it. Um, does that always mean that DeFi is always going to have some CeFi in it? Well, not in the purest form, Larry. In the pure, purest view, you don't need the function that an intermediary performed in the past. So in the purest form, it would be if you're trading stocks. Today, you have an exchange where buyers and sellers come in and agents of the, buy, of the institutional investor and agents of the retail investor are represented by brokers like Rosenblatt that actually consummate that trade on an exchange. In the purest form, which in the DeFi space is called automated market making AMM, the role that a traditional equity exchange like NASDAQ and IZ performs could technically be done simply using an automated market maker, which is a software algorithm that basically matches the buyers and seller and consummates that trade without any exchange, no clearing cooperation, instantly cleared and settled. I have to say, while that sounds very appealing, anybody with a brain will realize that we are far away from, even if it's technically possible, people are not gonna trust a system that operates just on that. So think about liquidity, for example, right? I, I mean, real-time liquidity, there's a reason why today's equity markets evolved over the last 30 years with market makers and specialists and SROs and exchanges, right? There was a reason why that existed. So we're not gonna move from that world to this decentralized finance, smart contract driven exchange model overnight. All I'm saying is that we're beginning to see quite a bit of rapid activity and it's starting from zero, but there's a lot of very quick activity growing into the DeFi space, but all of decentralized finance, even five years down the line, is still going to be no more than three, four, five percent of activity in any functional area, any financial activity of the entire total. But going from zero to five percent is still pretty big, pretty big, right? So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, Larry, yet in the purest form, software should be able to re replicate the intermediary function that was performed. If nothing else, just for the matching part, the liquidity, systemic risk issues, what happens if the market is under stress? Um, how you know ev everybody moves towards the same investment strategy. We, we, the DeFi space is not time tested, right? It's a new novel concept, but it needs to follow the rigors of time. And a lot of the criticism levied against it is saying it's a very fancy technical solution to a real financial problem. How do we get buyers and sellers? And we can't imagine that even though it's a very elegant technological solution, it actually is going to pass master in the data world. So somebody has to be providing the technology. Somebody has to write that code. Somebody has to have machines running it. So, you know, it can't just be you and me. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. So maybe I should no, let you finish you're your right, talk. Larry, <laughs> that they are, somebody's going to be writing the code, but I'll, I'll um, yes. And, and let me tell you the interesting part, the bigger picture, which I was going to lead into half an hour of the conversation, but I'll talk about it right now. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 Larry. The, the, the point is, you know, the way I'm, one of the subtle changes that's happening is if you see the entrepreneurs that are driving these decentralized finance companies, one of the major differences you see is 
they're not financial people like us that spent 25 years in the traditional finance industry and now woken up to DeFi. They are software developers that have not had a lot of financial background. They are the Jack Dorsey kind of people that stumbled upon payments and said, you know what, here's a space where software can dramatically improve the way payments happen. I'll take an example of a company that we hosted uh, two weeks ago. Uh, if you don't know about this company, you should look into it called Falcon X. And Falcon X is a San Mateo, California based company uh, backed by a bunch of uh, you know, top VCs and private equity guys. And the Falcon X CEO, um, an Indian gentleman called Raghu Yarlagada. Raghu in 2018 had just about spent five years working on, the, working on the Google Chrome product under Sundar Pichai, the current CEO of, of, of Google. And while at Google, he had zero finance background. And while at Google, he was asked by, this, by, by Sundar Pichai, who had not taken over as CEO of Google at that time, this was 2017. And he began looking at what potential blockchain would have in the traditional Google world. And within six months, <clears throat> he resigned his job and started writing code to build a prime brokerage platform to trade crypto for institutions. Fast forward two years later in 2020, when the Bitcoin price started climbing up from 15 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50, a bunch of institutions, lo and behold, started using the Falcon X platform. Now, what Falcon X is doing is simply it's a modern day prime broker that offers trade execution, clearing, and credit for anybody, any institution trading more than $500 million of crypto. So it's very much of a centralized finance, the top right-hand side example, modern day prime broker for using software to trade crypto. By our estimate, he's doing about four to $500 million in revenue right now at over 80% EBITDA, okay? He didn't have any background in finance. He has written this world-class product that's providing prime brokerage. Now offering prime brokerage in the traditional equity world is not light lifting. You do that after 25, 30 years of brand building experience and credit and you know, you have to have a lot of things and experience in the market before you offer prime brokerage services to institutions with equities. So what I'm saying is that the bigger picture is that, yes, to your point, Larry, there are people that are providing or firms that are providing that infrastructure. The difference is most of the leading companies are not run by traditional financial hands. And the investors backing them up are guys that have been backing up internet companies or web 3.0 companies. And they're now backing decentralized finance. They couldn't care what industry it is. They're not scared by the technical complexity of financial services. They're just saying it's a software issue. We can address part of it. Now, that by very nature is also going to limit its potential over time. We'll get to that in a second. But you're right to quite an extent, Larry, that yes, somebody is writing the software code, the smart contract. But one, it's not a financial institution. It's not a regulated entity. And a lot of those firms, take Falcon X, for example, he's doing all of that with like 200 people. So you're not having a prime broker operation of 5,000 people regulated entity by the SEC, 30 years experience doing this stuff. It's a company that's you know, put together in two and a half, three years time, already generating $500 million at a valuation of about 4 billion and growing by the day, right? So the, the, the we are seeing very smart entrepreneurs changing the game in finance, you know, and that's, you're talking about prime brokerage, which is pretty complicated activity. In payments, lending and borrowing, much simpler operations, you're seeing that happening at a much larger scale and a much faster speed. Um, won't spend too much time on this, but this is basically, you know, the left-hand side are the financial activities, you know, this typical trade life cycle, right? Front office, middle office, back office, pre-trade portfolio management, execution, custody, settlement, um, how those functional areas differ between traditional finance and decentralized finance. So take, for example, we talked about execution, traditional finance, intermediated model, equity securities, there's an exchange that brings buyers and sellers together. Decentralized finance, theoretically, buyers and sellers could be bought together simply by a smart contract. So custody, uh, in the traditional world, you've got obviously got custodians that are actually custody the assets. 
in the decentralized finance world, you have self custody, you don't need a central custodian, not by regulation, the structure of the instrument doesn't require a custodian to hold it. Now, in the C5 world, which is the way you trade crypto today, you have the option of keeping the crypto key in a hot wallet or a cold storage wallet, right? Um, if you're trading through Coinbase, then obviously your Coinbase is the custodian, right? <coughs> Here in the Boston area, we've got Fidelity Investments that just spend you know, the better part of two years building a Bitcoin custody service offering. Right, run by the Fidelity Digital Assets Division, run by a man called Tom Jessup. So there are examples, uh, here we talk about DeFi, but I'm just reminding you of the centralized finance, which is today, the crypto tokens are traded in a way where the custody of the crypto token could actually be done by a custodian, which is Coinbase in that world, it could be Fidelity or somebody else, right? Uh, others are firms like Galaxy, um, that bought a company called Bitco, which is a big custodian in that space. So this is just, you know, compare and contrast how these financial activities or these trade related functional activities differ between the traditional world and the decentralized finance world. Um, this is, you know, pretty complicated. I, I'd actually, you know, can only talk about it so much, but this is, you know, like we're used to thinking about a technology stack in the traditional world, in decentralized finance, this technology stack is much more collapsed in very simpler you know, hierarchy. But nevertheless, there is a hierarchy. And this just helps you understand certain terms that you keep hearing about. So for example, on the settlement layer, or what are called level one, level one protocols, that's where blockchain Ethereum, on which 90% of decentralized finance applications run, that's the base layer. Now, when you think about something like Solana, Avalanche, or a company called Polygon, which runs a crypto token called Matic, those are level two protocols that are running on the level one protocol. So on Ethereum, you could have a level two protocol built that takes some of the advantages of Ethereum and then builds upon it as a platform on which other financial act applications can be run over time. And then much of the action that we are used to thinking about financial activities or financial applications are at the application and protocol level. So when you think about, when you hear about things like yield farming, or you think about, um, you know, lending and borrowing crypto on platforms like BlockFi, that's happening at the application level. But the infrastructure is where you've got level one protocol, level two protocols, and all these, you know, tokens. And the tokens obviously could be a you know, non-fungible token, a fungible token, stable coins, all of that provides infrastructure and the application stuff is built on top of that. But the whole stack is much simpler, both technology and the financial stack than we be used to in the traditional finance world. I think the number one sort of the takeaway I want you to take from is it's, yes, it has got resemblance to traditional finance, but it's much cleaner, shorter stack, lot more software replacing what regulated financial entities used to do in the past. Um, I'm sorry, it's kind of you know, too small here, but you, you have the whole deck. It's simply showing you taking payments as an example. And uh, this is showing you that in you know, traditional finance, uh, if you've got, you know, Shri is the consumer. He's buying uh, a good from Amazon. He's paying 100 bucks for that. Amazon receives about 98 bucks as the merchant. The $2 on the left hand side, the traditional finance payment structure, you essentially have about $2 worth of cost that a whole slew of players are basically taking, you know, uh, or, or divvying up the $2 in any transaction. And there's an issuer related. A service charge, they're acquiring services, they're merchant banks, they're payment facilitators, people like Pfizer, right? All of those entities and traditional payments are replicated in the DeFi world using smart contracts. And that $2 fee goes down to approximately two cents. And all of those different entities are collapsed essentially into one or two different players. Back again to your point, Larry, yes, there is a central smart contract that's providing the role that the traditional community is done, but it's this much, right? And it's, it's two cents right now, it's going to a fraction of a cent very soon. Less friction, 
more convenience, instant access, instant clearing. Talking about clearing, I'll give you an example from our world in capital markets. Um, how many of you have heard of a company called Paxos? Anybody? So Paxos is um, a five-year-old company, venture capital funded company run by a man called Chad Cascarilla. Now I'll tell you why that's relevant, why it's important. Paxos has applied to the SEC um, to provide an alternative to the DTCC to instantly clear and settle trades using the blockchain, equity trades. So they want to take an equity security and um, after it's traded, you can clear and settle it instantly on the blockchain rather than the two day settlement cycle, now soon to go to a one day settlement cycle, which has been approved right now, but instant settlement on the blockchain. They've applied to the SEC, right? Under a, no, under a exemption letter granted by the SEC in 2019, Paxos for two years cleared and settled trades on the blockchain with six brokers for 12 securities for two years without a single problem. Instant settlement. No two days waiting for delivery versus payment. Talk about a game changer for settling and clearing trades. Now, of course, a lot of institutions are trading. They need those two days because they're not all self-funded accounts like they are fully funded accounts like retail trades are, right? If, if, you, if you have an account at Fidelity Investments, you have a full funded account, which means today if you're buying five shares in IBM, most likely you have money in the account. You don't need the two days to actually execute the trade today. And then you're waiting for two days to get the funding and to actually clear the trade. In institutional world, people need those two days. So many investors don't like this idea of real-time clearing and settlement. Not to mention the risk issues and the systemic you know, financial stability issues that could come up in an instantly cleared blockchain-based world. But what I'm telling you is two things. One, the technology to do that instant settlement on blockchain, whether it's payments, whether it's lending, whether it's securities, exists. Secondly, the regulators are not poo-pooing it anymore. No matter how much we think that it's very fashionable to, con to basically complain about regulators, regulators are a pretty smart bunch of people. And they're very carefully examining proposals like Paxos. There's right now a comment letter open for six months by Gary Gensler and his crew asking for the industry to comment on Paxos's requirement or the exemption from having a centrally cleared model. Um, I'll give another example. And I'll send a copy of this to Sri. You can share it with you guys. This is last week article in the Financial Times. Um, sorry, one, it's not actually not showing, but it's it's about a cryptocurrency platform called FTX that you guys might be familiar with. FTX is um, one of the largest crypto exchanges, and it's run by a thirty-year-old guy who always dresses up in shorts and a T-shirt called Sam Bankman-Fried. FTX has just applied to the CFTC for an exemption to, to, to clear and settle derivative trades, particularly futures contracts, uh, without a futures merchant, which today is the process. So every der derivatives contract or futures contract requires a futures merchant to clear and settle that trade. FTX is saying our software can provide the role that futures merchants have done in clearing and settling derivatives trades for the last 50 years. The CFTC is saying we are considering it and we are not dismissing it. We are very open to comments. The point is, if that is approved, then the FTX smart contract is going to replace and instantly clear and settle futures contracts that futures commission merchants have been clearing and settling for the better part of the last 30, 40 years. That's a fine example of today, smart contracts and software replacing what big institutions, regulated entities have done for the last 50 years. With all this mumbo jumbo DeFi, that's where it comes down to. And if we think this is five years out, buying this guy stuff, I'm, I'm giving you two examples between Paxos and FTX. This is happening today. Regulators are considering these proposals today, right? Um, do they have any? Do they have any patents to back it up? 
Uh, Hugh, I don't know. Uh, they, they may or might. So I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but uh, a lot of the stuff, frankly, is just open source. So it's not like it's, you know, the whole idea of the patent world, a lot of the soft, I mean, it, the blockchain itself is open source, right? So anybody can write anything on top of the blockchain. So a lot of this mindset that we have of patents that I create intellectual property, and I'm going to patent it. The, a lot of that stuff is, you know, goes out of the window in the DeFi space because all of the blockchain stuff is just open source. Right. Okay. So we don't hear as much of the pattern stuff in the blockchain space as much as we used to, which raises up the issue, obviously, as you know, how do you actually protect your intellectual property that you create, which, by the way, is going to be very much tougher to do in this new de decentralized finance space the way it used to be in the old world. The old world, you write a pattern, you protect it against it for the next 15, 20 years. Not so much more in the DeFi space. Okay. So listen, we've got 15 minutes. So you know, what I'll do is I'll just walk you through one or two slides and we'll open it up for questions. This is simply showing you that back to the framework of traditional finance, CFI and DeFi. Look at the types of companies that we used to see in the traditional finance space and now just drop down to DeFi. I bet two thirds of the companies in the DeFi space are unfamiliar to you. But each one of these companies in the bottom section, first of all, they're all unicorns. And many of those are five, ten billion dollar companies, right? So I'll take example of um, Aave. Aave is a company that provides a crypto token for easily lending and borrowing crypto cryptocurrencies. And the Aave coin and the Aave platform is used by other DeFi applications, what are called D apps, De decentralized finance applications, built on Aave to provide six to eight to 10% rates of return in lending crypto. And Aave right now is valued about six to $7 billion. So they are beginning to be large companies that are playing in the decentralized finance space across payment, lending, borrowing, investing and insurance that for us today seem, we don't know these companies, but um, I'll tell you, in a, in a, a lot of these companies are raising massive amounts of capital coming to the public markets and a lot of the traditional finance guys are very quickly moving downstream into crypto, but down from crypto into decentralized finance. And then I, my last slide, my, I've got another 20 slides after it, but I'll, I'll stop and take some questions and have a, have a good discussion. The way we think about the, the broader picture around the FinTech space is that, you know, if you look at what PayPal began in 2001 under eBay, that was the first wave of fintech evolution, right? Which was essentially a simple story of analog activities moving to digital. We know that story. It's played out quite well last 20 years. 2015 or so was the first time we saw the next wave of fintech change, which was this thing called embedded finance, which is most common examples of best use cases being in right sharing the way Uber and Lyft and everybody else have brought payments within the custom, customer experience. You can get out of Uber without thinking as for a second, it's all paid off, right? It's all combined into your ride sharing experience. You're not getting out of a taxi and swiping your card anymore. That embedded finance function is happening across the board where everybody's becoming a payment company. Same thing's happening in lending. The whole buy now, pay later is an example of lending at the point of sale. Third wave, when you think about transformation finance, is this whole decentralization of finance. By the way, we, we're saying it began in 2019. That's probably going to be a 20-year evolution over time. But over time, it's moving away from this centralized, regulated, entity-driven model to more of a decentralized framework. That essentially means not just our people like Falcon X, software developers like Jack Dorsey, playing a larger role in our space, but non-financial companies, including the large fangs, you know, Amazon and Google. And for the years we've been saying that Google has come to, you know, is knocking at the doors of the banking industry. But whether it's Google or Facebook, despite the fact that Facebook sunset their stablecoin initiative called Diem, it's a matter of time before non-financial companies are coming into the financial space to offer financial services. So that's the longer term story. So this basically shows you three waves of transformation of finance. 
First one being simple analog to digital, second being embedded finance, and third, this whole blockchain-based decentralization, which we are very much in the early innings of that happening. <clears throat> so let me just, you know, love to hear thoughts, comments. Um, you know, the idea of this was more to have an open conversation rather than tell you everything that you need to know about DeFi. You know, I think it started years ago, but people were talking about software as a service. I mean, SOS. Um, so this is, this is, a, I guess, another version of that. We're just coming back around to using it for different purposes, right? Yeah, in a way, uh, I mean, when I think about software as a service, Larry, I almost think about it's more like finance as a service. Like one of the companies that is very interesting that you should look at is a company called Drive Wealth run by a guy called Bob Leeper. Um, no, Bob Leeper <laughs> is right here. No? Different Bob. Bob <laughs> I'm nice seeing Bob see Leeper's it. face and uh, it's, it's Bob Cotright. But Drive, set up. Wealth, <laughs> Drive Wealth offers brokerage in a box. Oh, that's a good term. <laughs> right? I want to put my broker in a box. <laughs> Whether it's crypto in a box. Crypto in a box, okay. If you're a target, if you're a right. retailer, yeah. And you want to offer crypto trading, you go to Drive Wealth, they have the whole stack, just like Amazon Web Services has a stack that tomorrow you can start off running a business on the Amazon stack to pay a subscription fee. Uh, Drive Wealth offers you that brokerage in a box. Mm. You can get up and running in three months' time offering a brokerage product to your customers or a crypto product to your customers, which used to take the better part of two, three years to build over time. So the software as a service concept, I more think about that more as an embedded finance issue. The decentralized finance issue is slightly different. So Deshaun, um, thank you for calling me out and, and uh, putting me into another uh, uh, different uh, company. Uh, one of the things that I've always struggled with is there's so much focused on decentralized finance as far as crypto and stablecoin. I'm a huge fan. I think stablecoin is here to stay. But there aren't many places that are actually combining that with traditional finance as well. What, what do you see is that intersection of traditional stock trading, bond trading, even secondary uh, private equity combined with uh, 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 digital assets uh, and, and being is anybody kind of looking at that space to how, how do you consolidate all of that, particularly for either institutional or high, high net worth uh, wealth investors? Well, I mean, there, there are two aspects to that. One is that any kind of blockchain based digital asset, right, or what we call a tokenized asset, that can still be traded the old fashioned way with the, with the intermediary which is what we are calling centralized finance, right? There's plenty of that stuff happening. So let me, let me build the story up. So the first thing is simply saying, can we take today's set of assets, whether they're financial assets or tangible assets like oil and gold and commodities or intangible assets, um, those over time in the next five to 10 years could become unshackled and put on the blockchain, which just opens up a huge opportunity for them to be much more easily traded. It's kind of a crude analogy being when equities move from, you know, when they really got turbocharged and fully automated and electronic, that unleashed massive efficiency, reach, productivity, reduction of friction in equity trading, right? Volume skyrocketed. We've seen that across every equities, fixed income, derivatives, futures, commodities, foreign exchange, any financial product, when it's fully electronic, exp explodes in terms of adoption and growth. Same thing is any asset, when tokenized, just gets turbocharged to be able to trade it. But the difference is it's still being operating in the traditional finance intimidated driven model. The decentralized finance is a completely different technical construct. There it's basically saying, no matter what the asset is. Now, of course, by definition, decentralized finance means you can, if you've got to take an equity product trade in the decentralized finance space, 
that equity is going to be a tokenized equity, which means it should be running on the blockchain platform, right? Because all of decentralized finance is running on the blockchain. So once everything is tokenized, then they can technically be traded in decentralized finance world without any intermediary. So the way I think about it is more of a sequential step-by-step -step traditional equities, tokenized equities trading the old fashioned way and that tokenized equities trading in a completely DeFi world, which means no exchanges, no NASDAQ, smart algorithms, automated market making, magically connecting buyers and sellers out in the ether. That's the way I think about sort of sequence of activity. Which I, I fully agree with. I think it makes a lot of sense. I did put in a, a, a comment in the chat. Well, what about regulators, right? There's uh, KYC and uh, uh, other, other you know, anti-money laundering standards that people need to deal with. How do you deal with that in a completely decentralized manner? Yeah, no, absolutely. Great question. And I had a chart here. Let me show you. Um, so the way we, you know, one, one framework to look at the challenges are, you know, when, when think, people think about crypto, they're like, oh, it's just run, you know, it's, it's, it's just fraud and, uh, ransomware and hacking and all the illicit stuff you know is, is is happening on bitcoin and all these crypto tokens those are all set of issues related to the lack of maturity of a lot of this technology these assets the way i think about problems in this space are or the way regulators are thinking about it is they are structural problems and then the issues because of the lack of maturity a lot of the lack of maturity stuff that you can see in the bottom that will get weeded out over time so if you're a large institution trading large amounts of crypto, you can go and put a $500 million buy order for Bitcoin on Coinbase because there's so much market manipulation and spoofing and all the skullduggery that happened in the equities world in the 80s and the 90s is happening today in the crypto world, on all these exchanges. But that over time with more transparency, more investor education, better platforms, better price discovery, those lack of maturity issues are going to go away. But back to your point, Bob, the structural issues, for example, the anonymity issue, right? That it, recognizing somebody's identity in the traditional finance world was a first step to them being allowed to get a checking account, insurance contract, investment contract, whatever, right? And technically in the purest form, blockchain-based, all activities are anonymous. So we need to basically, <clears throat> compromise the purest view of this blockchain-based DeFi world if we need to have mainstream adoption of that. So the way that the regulators are looking at it is, think of decentralized finance is this no intermediary driven smart contract driven world, but they are probably gonna be traditional entities that authenticate that this happens to be Hugh or it's Sri or it's Bob or it's D they will do the AML KYC outside of this DeFi world. And then once your identity is verified, you're allowed to be in this world of decentralized finance. And then you may be anonymous, right? But there's probably gonna be some compromise that will have to be happen if you need to make this all mainstream. So a lot of the, you know, people that were very libertarian driven blockchain guys are, coming to the realization that we really want to make this mainstream, we've got to meet regulators and meet the concerns of the average person halfway and say, we need to address some of the ML KYC issues. But I think one of the frameworks to look at is in my, in my, the way we are looking at it is lack of maturity issues and structural problems. Another structural problem is this whole issue of, if you have no intermediaries, no shock absorbers, no circuit breakers, no specialists, standing in the way, what happens when markets are under severe stress, when liquidity dries up, right? Then it shit hits the fan, right? And we haven't seen that in DeFi right now. I mean, it's bad enough with all these shock absorbers, you know, we almost burned the place down in 2008. So this software driven DeFi world, when there are companies that are not run by financial guys that have been around for 20, 30 years, uh, just software running, it sounds really good, until something really bad happens, until there's massive stress happening in the world, then all of the stuff could actually seize up. So back again, one of the structural problems in DeFi 
is the financial stability, those issues which we are very much grappling with right now. Another structural problem we're grappling with is just from a regulatory standpoint, are a lot of these things, even securities, how do we, you know, something called the how we test, which has always been used by the SEC to declare something as a security or not. A lot of those, is this a security or not test, have to be applied to these tokenized assets. And it's very difficult to do that, right? So those are things that regulators are dealing with today. Is this a commodity? Like today you're thinking about Bitcoin as a commodity, but then if there's a Bitcoin futures contract, is that still a commodity? No, well, that becomes a security and it's a derivative contract. So it becomes under the SFT, SCFTC. But then there are lots of other, you know, crypto derivatives that fall between the cracks between the SEC and CFTC. Neither regulatory body is overseeing them. So I'm just, before, actually, just before we came on at, on NPR, they were talking about, uh, you know, the guy, Kaz, uh, the guy from California who's always on. Um, he was talking about the, the, the notion that the dollar could be somehow tied to stable coin. And, and, you know, I've heard other people saying this, is that why doesn't the government just turn everything into, you know, to like, get rid of the dollar in some sense or tokenize the dollar or do something to the dollar? I mean, what do you, because right. the government's another big player, you know, uh, sitting in the room here with us. Um, what do you yeah, think? No, absolutely, Larry. In fact, um, so that, that that is what is called, uh, if you look at stable coin, the idea of a stable coin, there are two types of stable coins. They're private stable coins. Uh, the two biggest ones being USDC run by or issued by a Boston-based company called Circle that you guys might have heard of run by a guy called Jeremy Allaire. So that is a private stable coin because USDC, it's called USDC, United States Digital Coin. Wow. Okay. The second one that you would also know, probably have heard about is obviously Tether. So Tether and USDC are just two examples of private stable coins. Government issued stable coins, right, are absolutely something that Jerome Powell or the Federal Reserve has been working on for the last, or not working on, but is thinking about doing. And every single large country in the world has an initiative to tokenize their own, their own currency. Oh, great, okay. <laughs> That's already happening. Right. And an example of that would be, or, or the power of that would be, if you can tokenize the dollar, think about sort of, you know, 30 years ago, you had cash. Then you had digitization of dollars. So you, rather than me paying Hugh, physically meeting him at the racket club and giving him a dollar, I could send it over Venmo or whatever, right? 20 years ago, PayPal. That's digital dollar. It's sitting in his account, waiting for him to spend it whenever he wants to. So that's digital dollar as well. But a tokenized dollar would be programmatic currency. And let me give you a use case of that. So last two years, US government doled out billions, almost a trillion dollar worth of funds to businesses because they were not operating, right? Now, <laughs> a programmatic currency would be, I'm sending you Mr. Taxi Driver for the next one month because you're not working $5,000. But because it's programmatic currency, I can code into the dollar what you can spend the dollar on. Right? Uh -oh. So you can only use the dollar sitting in your account for buying groceries or kids' education or whatever. Secondly, I'm giving you 5,000 bucks, but programmatically, you will only be allowed to utilize one fourth of it every week. Thirdly, in two weeks' time, if the governor of New York says, well, the market's opened up, cabbies can go back to work, $2,500 can magically vanish out of your account. So that programmatic element you can do with a tokenized dollar. Yeah, but that sucks. No one wants that. I want, I want something that you can't pull, the, pull it back from me. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah the, the government is too smart for that. But, yeah, but yeah, Larry, yeah. you don't want that because there, there is a reason why we have central banks executing control. It's not just you know financial. It's not only about individual liberty. It's financial stability. It's cross-border movement. It's managing the dollar as an asset worldwide. Okay. Right. right. So you right. want to have some controls and measures in place. And I'm sorry, I got to run in a minute's time, but. Absolutely, that point around government tokenizing your currency, fiat currency, is it's going to happen in the next two, three years. 
right? But the libertarian, the crypto token guys, the Bitcoin guys don't like that idea. They're just compromising saying, um, we would like the whole world to just do away with the dollar and the renminbi and the pound sterling and the rupee and the yen and just use Bitcoin. But the what reality about, is the whole world's not gonna move in that direction. What so about border? Bitcoin could become a halfway thing. Go ahead, Adam. I was going to ask, doesn't this, couldn't this just enable the return of barter and do away with currency altogether? Yeah, except that or it's not for everything. Digital barter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Guys, I'm sorry, I, I've got to run to, to something personal, but um, Shri, thank you as always. And in fact, to, to, to all of you for having, you know, Rosenblatt and me, love to continue the conversation face to face, um, but keep an eye on the space. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I'm like you guys, I came from the traditional world, but in the last 26 years, I have never been more intellectually interested in anything, uh, any, any close to, to, to all of this stuff. Some of the smartest brain power, uh, big institutions, investors, governments are spending time, money and effort focused on this space. Uh, and we hope to be doing a lot of business in this area, you know, going forward. So my, my takeaway would be, you know, just spend as much time as you can sort of reading up and getting up to speed on this phase. Deshaun, uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah, thank, Please share thank the deck. you. Thank you so much, Dee. This was an absolute pleasure. And are you going to be sending the slides? I can put it on the distribution sure, list. Sure, Yeah, perfect. I'll do that. This is a small sanitary, I mean, a, a, a condensed version of it that I'll send over to you. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so Great. much. Thanks, and, guys. Uh, All the best. Thank you. Really We'll be talking again next week, uh, next, uh, next month. Take care. See you. Bye-bye. everyone. Bye.